Now we will be going over the National Institutes of Health Stroke Scale. This stroke scale has an acronym, NIHSS for short, and I'll be introducing you to it and reviewing the testing elements. The NIHSS is a standardized stroke severity scale. It is not a diagnostic exam because it cannot localize where a patient's stroke is. As well as it is an 11 item scoring system, but the severity scale, when it comes to looking at the neurological deficits, it grossly overestimates the right hemisphere and the posterior circulation. So that we, on top of doing the NIHSS, doing a more comprehensive neurological exam in your patients is gonna get a more balanced exam from your patients. But this exam allows us to quantify our clinical exam, determine if the patient's neurological status is improving or deteriorating, and provide for standardization and a way for us to communicate among healthcare providers the patient's status. As far as the scoring for the NIHSS, a patient who scores a zero, this doesn't mean that they didn't have a stroke. It just means they have no stroke symptoms. A minor stroke will be a score from one to four. It increases to a moderate, and then finally on to a severe stroke when you hit 21 or more points. A few guiding principles when doing the NIHSS is that the most reproducible response is generally the first response. As well, you do not coach your patients unless it's specified in the instructions that you're allowed to. Also, some items are scored only if definitely present and record what the patient does, not what you think the patient can do. Unlike other tests, when you get points, the higher the points, the better it is. When it comes to the NIHSS, the more points you get, the more severe your stroke is. So the more intact your patient is with having, without having any signs of a stroke, they're going to be closer to a zero. The first question, number one, is divided up into A, B, and C, all relating to level of consciousness. The first one is looking at your patient's response just as you approach them in the room. You're looking to see, is your patient alert? Are they keenly responsive? Are they not alert? But by giving them minor stimulation, just by touching them, they're able to talk to you and obey commands or respond to you. Um, that would be one point. If they're not alert and they require repeated stimulation to attend to, or they're obtunded, requiring strong, painful stimulation to make movements, but that once you actually give them pain, maybe sternal rubbing them, they do do that, then you're going to give them two points. You'll give your patient three points if your patient makes no movement other than reflexive posturing in response to a noxious stimulation. So if you do sternal rubbing and all they do is do um, decorticate or decerebrate posturing, they would get three points. The second part of level of consciousness is asking the patient some questions. You're going to ask the patient their age and wait for their response, and you're going to ask them what's the month and wait for their response. When it comes to this question, we do not coach them and we do not give partial credit. For these questions, if they answer both correctly, they do not earn any points. If they only get one right and one wrong, they get one point. And if they answer both incorrectly, they'll get two points. If a patient is aphasic and they can't comprehend the questions, you're going to give them two points. They cannot answer either of them correctly. If patients unable to speak due to an endotracheal tube intubation or oral tracheal trauma or severe dysarthria from any cause, including having a language barrier or any other problem not secondary to aphasia, they will earn one point. The third part of level of consciousness is following commands. You're gonna ask the patient to open and close their eyes and then grip and release your hand. And you're gonna use the patient's non-paretic hand, so their hand that actually has strength in it. Because we're seeing can they follow directions. With this one, you're going to give them credit if there's an unequivocal attempt made. And so you can see that they're actually trying to squeeze your hand, but they can't do it you can give them credit. If the patient does not respond to a command, the test should be demonstrated. So you can actually demonstrate and coach them in doing it. Point to your eyes so that you can show them when your eyes are open and then show them eyes closing to have them mimic you. The second item is best gaze. With this one, you're going to ask the patient to follow your finger as you move it horizontally across their face. 
They should be tracking you with their eyes and you want to get the point to the point that their pupils are, go, are what we call burring the entire way. So when their eyes are looking all the way to the right, their right eye and their left eye should have no white of their eyes visible to, on the right side past their pupil. And the same thing when you move them to the left. For a patient who's unconscious, you can use the oculocephalic maneuver for that. And for this one, it is okay to coach the patient. And as well, you may have to establish eye contact and physically move yourself from one side of the patient to the other to try to get them to track you across the room to see what their eye movements are doing. So as far as scoring for this one, if they have normal horizontal movements and they can bury the full way, they earn no points. Uh, you can see here for the patient on the bottom left, this patient is looking to the, his right, but his left eye, you can see there's still some whites of his eyes that you can see next to his pupil. So he is going to earn one point. He has a partial gaze palsy. And then the patient to the right here, we can see that even when we're trying to have them look at us or look at our finger, they're having a forced gaze only to one side. These patients are not able to move their eyes, and so this patient would receive two points because they have a complete gaze palsy. They can't move it past midline to get to look to their right. For the patients who are not responsive, you can do a, an involuntary um, eye test called the oculocephalic reflex, also known as the doll's eyes test. And uh, with this one, the normal response to this would be that both eyes move in the opposite direction of head movement. And then an abnormal response will be that one eye moves appropriately and one eye doesn't. And then it's absent is when both eyes remain fixed. So let's take a look at some pictures to help you with this. So you probably will need to open your patient's eyes because we don't do this for a patient who's with it and can follow directions to try to look side to side. And so with doll's eyes, you're gonna, you might need to open up their eyelids. And as you turn the patient's head from the right to their left, as you can see on the top here, it's normal. If I turn them to their right, that they're, both their eyes look to the left. And if I turn their head to their left, their eyes look the opposite way to their right. And this is a normal response we expect when a, they're, they're intact with this reflex. If it's abnormal, you can see here in the middle, when you turn the patient's head to the right, one eye stays looking to the right, but one eye looks correctly to the left, means it's partially intact. And then if it's absent here at the bottom, as you move their head side to side, their eyes stay exactly with whatever direction their head is moving. Next up is visual fields. With this, you're gonna ask the patient direct to look directly in your eyes or at your nose. And in the picture here, I did the green dotted lines to show you how you're gonna make quadrants. And you're going to be testing if the patient can see your fingers and see your fingers move in each quadrant. You're gonna test the upper quadrants and the lower quadrants. And you wanna be probably about three feet away and on the same level as the patient. You don't, don't wanna be looking down at them. You want your eyes to be at the same level. And so you'll test both, th both sides to see if they can see your finger moving, because we're seeing is there any deficit in any four quadrant. So how we uh, score this, if your patient has no visual loss, they can see your fingers in all quadrants, you're going to give them no points. If they have a, a partial hemianopsia, so they have either a sector or a quadrant where there is missing vision, you can see that in black here, um, you're going to give them one point. If a patient has a complete hemianopsia, so they have a full hemisphere and one or both eyes that are gone, you're going to give them two points. And then at the bottom, if they cannot see you at all, it's bilateral hemianopsia or blindness, you're going to give them three points. If there is unilateral blindness as their baseline or they have an enucleation, so their eyeball is no longer there, you're only going to test the vision of their good eye. The next item is facial palsy. And with this one, you're simply going to ask the patient to smile. You're going to look at the symmetry of the smile, both when they're smiling and when they're not smiling. You're going to look at their nasal labial fold, and you're seeing if they're able to elevate both sides of their mouth bilaterally equally. As well, you're going to be taking a look at their forehead. And it's normal if you ask the patient to lift their eyelids to see wrinkles um, across your forehead. Um, but a patient may have weakness there. So with these patients, we're gonna score them zero points if they have a normal symmetrical movement of their face. If they have a minor, pra minor paralysis, meaning they have a 
a flat and nasolabial fold, or when they smile, there's a little asymmetry on one side, you're gonna give them one point. If they have a partial paralysis, and this is where we consider a total or near paralysis of just the lower face. So when you, they try to smile, their one side goes up, but the other side doesn't at all, but their eyelids both can go up and you have creases in their forehead, you're gonna give them two points. They only have a partial paralysis near their mouth. You're gonna give them three points if they have a complete paralysis on the entire side of the face or both. So it means that both they're unable to smile on that one side and as well they're not unable to lift their eyebrows and see that they have um, forehead folds. For a patient that is aphasic or confused, you may have to give them pain to actually see the symmetry of their mouth when it's in motion. So looking at these pictures, we can see um, to the left here, this man has a little decreased nasolabial fold on the right. You can see as he's talking that there's actually movement on that right-hand side. So he would earn one point. In the middle, this woman here, we can see as she's trying to smile, she can only move the left side of her face and you can see the forehead wrinkles, but you can see on her right side, she has complete paralysis of that lower quadrant of her face. So she's gonna earn two points. And then the man to the right, we can see that he lacks the folds on his forehead from lifting his eyebrow. He can't lift that left, his right eyebrow. And he also is unable to lift up the right side of his face in a smile. So he has a com complete um, paralysis of that right side of his face and he will earn three points. Items five and six are testing the motor and legs of the patients. And with this one, we're going to test each limb one at a time. And you're going to start with the limb that is not impaired. You're going to place the limb at an appropriate position. So if it's the arm, you're going to extend the arm straight, palm down at 90 degrees, or if, if the patient's sitting. If they're lying in bed, you're going to do it at 45 degrees if they're supine. And with your testing of their leg, you'll raise their leg about 30 degrees up. With this, you're going to see if the patient has a drift. So does the patient's arm or leg fall? So does the arm fall before 10 seconds or will the leg fall before five seconds? So with this one, it's really recommended as you have the arm going up, remember one arm at a time, you actually, with your fingers, you start counting out all the way from one to 10, showing your fingers increase to 10 seconds. And you can really encourage the patient to try to keep their arm up in this one. With the leg, you'll just count out for five seconds. With this test, you might see your patient have a little dip, perhaps, or a drift. And a dip is a very small change that the patient tries to instantaneously, instantaneously correct. Whereas a drift is that the limb is lowering to any significant degree, and when they have that, it is never considered normal. They will earn points for this. So let's go over the points. So if the patient has no drift and they're able to keep their arms up for 10 seconds and both legs up for five seconds, they would earn no points. If the patient has a drift, but their arm and the leg never actually hits the bed, they earn one point. If the patient has a drift towards the bed, but you can tell they've put in some effort towards gravity. So it's not like the arm just drops right to the bed right away. They put in some effort, but the arm hits the bed, they're gonna get two points. If you lift it against gravity and the arm falls right away and there's no effort, um, they may score a three or a four, because right, this patient's not showing any movement. But with this patient, you can ask the patient to shrug their shoulder or move their arm or leg side to side and see if there's any movement. If there's any trace muscular movement in the arm when trying to shrug the shoulder or moving the limb side to side, they get a three. If when you ask them to try to shrug the shoulder or move the arm side to side, they can't, they will get four points. If the patient has an amputation or a joint fusion, you will not be testing that extremity. The next test is a cerebellar test, looking at limb ataxia. And with this one, we're gonna be able to detect unilateral, a unilateral cerebellar lesion. So with this one, we do the finger to nose test and the heel to shin test. So you're gonna ask the patient to touch their nose and then to touch your finger and go back and forth. 
And then you're going to ask them to put their heel on the top of their um, knee and then go along their shin. And of course, we're going to test the side that does not have weakness first. And we're looking to see, does the patient have smooth, accurate movements? Because when a patient has ataxia, it means they cannot control their movements well. With this one, we can, we are allowed to do verbal cues to walk them through the steps. And of course, we're testing each limb separately. We also want to remember, this is not a test of weakness. So this, we need to make sure that the patient's ataxia is out of proportion to weakness. So if they're weak and can't perform it correctly, we're not going to give them points for ataxia. They actually have to show that they have issues with gross motor control. So for these patients, they get zero points if they're intact and there's no sign of ataxia. If it's present in one limb, they'll get one point. And if it's present in two limbs, they'll get two. And remember, ataxia is what is scored for the patient. If a patient can't understand the exam or they're paralyzed with weakness, their score is zero. We're not going to give them points for something they can't prove. The next test is a sensory test for item eight. And with this, we're gonna use a safety pin, and we're gonna use a single patient for single time only. So we're gonna put this in a sharps container after we use it. And we're gonna do little pricks on their face, arms, and legs. And we're gonna ask them, does each side feel the same compared to the other side? If a patient has normal sensory, um, they're not going to earn any points. If they have mild to moderate sensory, meaning the patient is aware of being touched, but they notice that the pinprick is less sharp or it's more dull on an affected side, they earn one point. If the patient has severe or total sensory loss, meaning the patient is not aware at all that they're being touched on the face, arm, or leg, they will get two points. Um, also to note, stupors and aphasic patients will probably score zero or one point based on if they give you any facial grimaces showing that they got poked. Um, and remember, we only record sensory loss due to stroke. This is not testing for peripheral neuropathy. And we only record sensory loss if it is clearly demonstrated. If you can't truly tell that they have a sensory loss, we're not going to give them points for it. Next up we have is best language. And with this one, we use our stroke cards. And we're going to be testing our patient's ability to, to name, repeat, and their comprehension. As well, we can tell if a patient has, deficit, uh, has attention deficits. So this is one of the cards here, and we're going to ask them to name these objects. Another card here, we're going to ask them to read these sentences. And we're looking to see how fluent and clear that they are speaking. Also, if a patient, when we came here to the items, if they're not able to speak, you can actually allow them to write out their answers, because usually written um, is parallel to spoken deficits, so they are allowed to do that. So also, if they're intubated, they can write out the answers to those. You ask them to read the sentences, and then here you're going to ask them to look at this picture and show what is wrong with this picture. And you'll be able to tell, do they have attentional deficits? Maybe they actually have a field cut, so they're only going to see one side of the picture. Or are there attentional deficits that they're not noticing that there's something wrong in the picture, that the water's overflowing the sink, or that the boy trying to grab the cookie is on a stool that's about to fall? With regards to scoring of best language, if a patient has no aphasia, they have normal fluency and comprehension, they earn zero points. If they have mild to moderate aphasia, so they have some obvious loss of fluency or comprehension, but they're able to get their idea across, you can figure out what they're saying, you're going to give them one point. If they have severe aphasia, so that all communication is limited, and the examiner, you pretty much have to guess what they're trying to communicate, you're going to give them two points. And the difference between that and three points is the patient's unresponsive. They're mute, they are globally aphasic, and they don't have any usable speech or any auditory comprehension, and the patient is unable to follow any of our one-step commands, they earn three points. Patients also, when it comes to the naming of the objects, we sort of think that once they've missed more than two thirds of the objects and the sentences, or if they're only able to follow a few of the simple one step commands for this test, they would score two points. The 10th item is dysarthria. And this is looking at the clearness with which the patient is talking. So with this one, you're going to ask the patient to read another stroke card, um, as you can see here on the right. And if the patient has aphasia, 
we're going to look at the clarity of the articulation of their speech um, to also uh, rate it. So scoring for dysarthria is if they have normal speech, we're going to give them no points. If they have mild to moderate dysarthria, so they slur some words, but we can understand what they're saying, they'll get one point. If they have severe dysarthria, so their speech is so slurred and unintelligible in the absence or out of proportion to any dysphagia, um, or they're mute, they'll get two points. If your patient is intubated or has any other physical barrier from communicating, you're not going to give them any points. The last item we score is extinction and inattention or neglect. With this test, uh, we have to do it in more than one field. So we can't just test tactile. We're going to also do tactile and visual. Uh, so with tactile, we're going to do this by touching our patient's arms and uh, arms and legs. So I'm going to touch the right arm and ask which arm I'm touching. Of course, ask them to have their eyes closed. Ask them which arm they're tu you're touching. Touch the opposite arm. Ask them which arm you're touching. And then touch both at the same time. And you're going to see if they have extinction to only one side. And this will be when you touch both arms, they say they only feel it on one side. And you're going to do this on the arms and on the legs. And then you can do a test here for visually, where you can give your patient a piece of paper and you'll just write lines all over it. And you're going to give them a pen and you're going to ask them to cross all the lines that they see. And if you can see here in this example, the patient's only filling out what lines they see on the right side. So we can see they have an inattention, they're neglecting to see what's on the left side of the page. As well, you can also, another test you can do is you show the patient their arm and you ask them whose arm it is. And if they can recognize it as themselves, they're intact. But if they say it's your arm or don't respond, uh, or, sorry, if they say it's your arm, then it means they don't, they're not recognizing their own arm. For extinction, um, this is where the patient feels the touch on both sides separately, but when touched on both sides, they report it only be on one side. When it comes to the scoring, if there's no abnormality, they're going to get zero points. If the patient has visual, tactile, auditory, spatial, or some type of personal inattention or extinction to bilateral simultaneous testing in one or both modalities, so it has to be in more than one, you'll get one point. If the patient has a profound hemi inattention or hemi inattention to more than one modality, like they don't recognize their own hand or they orient to only one side of, side of space, they will earn two points. For extinction, remember that this is one way that you can get the tactile um, exam out of them. So when to communicate the, NH, the NHSS results. So when your patient has any type of neurological decline, so if they have an increase in two to four, four points. I mean, something to remember about the NIHSS is that it's not a linear exam. So if I change from one to three points, so the patient goes from being able to move his arms to not being able to move one arm at all, that is a huge increase compared to someone who's maybe a score of a 22 to a 24. That, can, that is a much smaller change in results. As well, if you any, notice any new focal deficit, or an advancing neurological deficit, so maybe as your shift and the prior shift, the, the numbers have been increasing, or any other concerns, you want to make sure you notify the prescriber. Um, that's what I said. And remember that if there is a change, it might be slight, which might be due to an individual variability, but you want to strongly consider immediate communication for change, um, ev even of a single point when it comes to any motor strength, sensory change, or any visual field deficits. Please notify your provider. Next up, we'll be talking about the nursing care of the stroke patient.